I think you'll learn that passwords are actually the keys to the kingdom. Almost all systems are engineered so that an entity with a password has access. Easy, simple, straightforward, efficient access to resources. So a user that has a password can sit down and actually access everything they need to access, email and servers, uh, network connections and so forth. And that's great. That's great for usability. That's fantastic for efficiency. And that's why an ethical hacker goes straight after passwords as early as possible after looking around, footprinting and enumerating. One of the first things we'll try to do is grab some passwords, whether we're going to brute force them, engineer them or whatever. And I'll talk about the different approaches. This is really critical because once we have some passwords, once we actually have username and password combinations, we can start doing things like logging in locally. We can remote in oftentimes through VPNs or tunnels. We can actually become part of an IPSEC process. We can join systems to a domain and become a trusted entity within a domain. All kinds of wonderful, wonderful hacking options come available to us when we've got an authentic username and password. And if we can get that in a way that's not detected by administrators, that's not defect detected by the defenders of the network, and hopefully is long lived, maybe even has a little bit of privilege to give us access to what we want, well, that's golden. But ultimately, the key is to get a username and a password. It's going to be extremely useful throughout the entire process, throughout everything we do here. It makes it easier to hide tracks. It makes it easier to distribute malware, to infect systems, all that kind of stuff. And certainly some passwords are a lot easier to crack than others or easier to guess than others. And there's some very specific reasons for that that I want to show you. Based on a lot of research and talking to folks at conferences and looking at reports and so forth, I can tell you that most common password requirements in, in companies and in government agencies, wherever you look, almost all passwords have certain characteristics. They have to be eight or more characters typically. They have to be upper and lower case. They have to have a number in it. They have to have some type of alpha, non-alphanumeric character in there. They can't be repeated, or if they can be repeated, it's uh, only after quite a long time. Like, for example, the last 24 passwords are stored, or the last 12 passwords are stored, so they can't be repeated very often. Passwords typically expire after about 60 days. Between 60 and 90 is usually the rule of thumb there, and then require some type of change. And oftentimes, or almost always, there's some type of account lockout on wrong passwords. So a user types in the wrong password three times within five minutes, let's say, and they're locked out for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or till an administrator intervenes or till they use some type of self-service unlock system. But these are really, really common. And the eight or more characters and the mixed case are going to be the ones that I want to talk about immediately because those are the ones that make it easier or harder for us to crack based on what's going on in the environment. I've got some really common password examples here and there's a reason I've engineered these this way. I've got different lengths, I've got different types of upper, lower, I've got different uh, combinations of alpha, numeric, non-alpha numeric, got some spaces in there on a couple of them and so forth. So you can actually take a look and see that this represents really a good assortment of the different types of passwords you'll, you might see on systems. And maybe you've used some of these, probably not most of them actually, but you've probably seen some of these or something very like some of these and, and probably use them in your environment. And I want to explain why some of these are useful and some of these are not useful. To explain really the, the use and certainly the strength of these different password combinations or character combinations, I need to draw a couple of lines and show you where the boundaries are for these passwords. So the boundaries are actually right here where you see the red line and the green line. The red line indicates that there are seven characters in those passwords and you can see that all these passwords have more than seven characters. That's fantastic. Goes back to our earlier principle of having eight or more characters. The green line represents 14 characters, and only a couple of these passwords have more than 14 characters. Most of them have right between seven and 14 characters. 
8 to 10 to 12 characters, which is really, really typical in an enterprise. And what we need to know about that is that seven character passwords are weak passwords. Weak, 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 weak. Anything with seven or less is going to be a weak password because it means the next seven are blank. Any passwords with eight or more characters, eight to 14 characters rather, are less weak, but still relatively weak. And then any password that's longer than 14 characters is considered strong because of the cryptography behind it, because of the way they're hashed and stored, a 15 or more character password is really important. What you should definitely take away from this is not just the length of the password, but the fact that the complexity of the password doesn't matter a whole lot because alpha, numeric, upper, lower, uh, non-alphanumeric characters, that kind of thing, there's still two seven character password chunks. And so because of that limitation, because of how Windows hashes and stores these things, they're still vulnerable to the attacks that we can conduct against these passwords.